Okay. All right. Uh, greetings. Uh, my name is Kathy. I'm with the Friends of Arlington's David M. Brown Planetarium. And while we're all locked down, uh, we're trying to bring you some, uh, some interesting talks with some people. Uh, so today, we've got Dr. Tyler Nordgren, who uh, is an astronomer. Right now, he's based in New York, but he's been in a lot of different places. And he is an expert on many things, among them uh, solar eclipses and auroras. And he's led tours um, uh, with uh, groups going to see solar eclipses and, uh, and auroras. He's also written a book called Sun, Moon, Earth about eclipses. Uh, and he's going to talk to us uh, today and uh, show us uh, some slides. But I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to him and let him get started here. Uh, hi, Kathy. Uh, very nice to be here. And thank you for having me. Uh, let's see. What I've done is I've put together a, uh, a, a slideshow to share with folks. Because in addition to being an astronomer, uh, I'm also an artist. And I have done photography, graphic design work. Uh, and in fact, in recent years, uh, I've got a, a series of graphic design work for the 2017 total solar eclipse that's been collected by the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. So I'll show a little bit of that today. Great. So let me go ahead and share the screen here. Okay. All right. So one of the one of the things that I've really been excited about over these last few years is finding a way to take astronomy and science education out of the classroom and get it out into the countryside, out into national parks. And it's it's one of the things that I've been very fortunate enough to be able to, to do because I've, I've always had a love of travel. As a kid, I grew up in Oregon and Alaska. And so things like glaciers and snow-capped mountain peaks, that, that's just my youth. And it's, it's something that I, I grew up reading things like National Geographic magazine and these far off locations. That plus Carl Sagan's Cosmos just fired my, my youthful imagination. And so I want to be able to go off to these exotic locations that were places like Yellowstone National Park uh, or Glacier National Park to, to see these glacier carved valleys. But also when you finally get out to places like that, you get to see things like the Milky Way overhead. And so starting about 10 years ago, I began working with the National Park Service to promote their dark skies and their, their night sky programs. And this is one of the posters. So in addition to those photographs uh, that you just saw, I also do graphic design work to spread the, the mystique and the awe, the, the beauty, the romance of travel to exotic locations. And unfortunately, uh, a pristine night sky has become an exotic scene uh, that most people cannot see today. Places like Chaco Culture National Historical Park out in northwestern New Mexico, where you can see the Milky Way stretching from horizon to horizon over these ancestral Pueblo and uh, ruins are things that that just cause awe in the people that that manage to get there and when you show them these places they can learn about the history of what makes us human beings and human uh, development and cultures but having the sky overhead you also learn about where we are what does it mean to be a human being within this this larger universe a universe that you can see for yourself and so uh, I've worked with the International Dark Sky Association to help get people out into those places. And right now, uh, coming up, we've got uh, International Dark Sky Week, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, and as a former board member for the International Dark Sky Association, getting people out to experience astronomy, to experience science out in nature has been one of my big goals for these, these last, really this last decade. But one of the things that I, I want to, to share with folks about, especially right now, today, is that while the stars may be the things that get people to go out to a national park or maybe to travel uh, more broadly <laughs> in times when we can travel, 
uh, maybe things like the stars and dark skies, uh, natural vistas. The beauty of our universe that's on display is more than just those stars. Uh, and for me, growing up in Alaska, part of it is the Northern Lights. Um, so here's, here's a photograph that I took just outside of Anchorage, Alaska, where I, I grew up as a kid. And there you can see this amazing red and, and pale green display of the Aurora. And as, as a kid growing up in Alaska, this was a, an iconic feature of, of what it meant to be somebody growing up, somebody living in the North, not just Alaska, but in Northern climates all around the earth. Uh, so Canada, Norway, Iceland. Um, and it's something that when I left Alaska, when I went off to college down in, in Portland, Oregon, and then to, to graduate school at Cornell University in, in upstate New York, the Northern Lights became a part of my childhood. They, they were something that I didn't have uh, an experience with anymore. But starting about uh, five years ago, I began working with a company leading Northern Lights trips back to Alaska. And so you go up there and you can see, uh, especially around the equinoxes, the spring and fall equinoxes are when uh, the Northern Lights typically are stronger, but, but really they can be any time of year. But of course, in the Arctic, during the summer months, you can have 24 hours of daylight. So they, Northern Lights, tend to be things that you only see in the winter, maybe uh, late fall, early spring, but that's about it. And so uh, as you can see. Question for you. Oh, sure. Um, how, uh, how far down south can you see the Northern Lights? You know, that's a fantastic question. And it turns out uh, when, for instance, my wife, who's also an astronomer, uh, who she went out to the Hopi Reservation uh, wants to, to teach some school kids out there about modern astronomy. She got a chance to talk to some of the uh, Hopi elders who shared with her this experience they had when they were children of seeing what looked like a red glow on the northern horizon as if there was a forest fire off in the distance, but they knew that there were no forests off in that direction. And in talking to them, what we realized was they were seeing the northern lights. So this is, this is down in northern Arizona. And there, there are reports of seeing them uh, all across uh, sort of the, the mid latitudes of the United States. But that only happens under extremely special circumstances when the sun. And so one of the things I'm gonna be getting at here with the aurora, with eclipses, is that what we're really talking about is the sun, an appreciation of the magnetic power of the sun in the case of the aurora. Uh, so the sun goes through an 11-year cycle of activity when there are more sunspots, when the magnetic fields on the sun become more twisted and knotted, and you can get things called coronal mass ejections, so giant eruptions of, of charged particles off the sun, carrying the sun's magnetic field lines with it, and those interact with the Earth's magnetic fields. And when charged particles uh, encounter our atmosphere, they light up the gases in our atmosphere like a current through a, a gaseous tube of, say, neon. And you get uh, a neon sign glowing the bright red colors while the oxygen and nitrogen in our atmosphere glow red and green. And so when you're someplace, like in this case, Fairbanks, Alaska, you can be right underneath what's called the auroral oval, where you're probability of seeing the northern lights is at its greatest because directly overhead is where these charged particles encounter our atmosphere they light up and you get this amazing green glow but on those rare occasions when you have big eruptions like say these coronal mass ejections you can get that auroral oval pushed down to the point where you can see it all across the uh, the, the northern states of the u.s in fact, the last time I had seen the Northern Lights prior to going back to Alaska was in 1991 from central New York, from, from the, the Cornell University campus. And when I did the math, I realized that's because in 1991, we were at one of those peaks of activity. And that activity fluctuates over a course of 11 years. 
right now, we're at the minimum. So very little activity on the sun, very few of these eruptions. So right now is not a good time to go looking for the northern lights from southern locations. But you go up to Alaska and odds are every two or three nights, three or four nights, there'll be some kind of rural activity. And I've been leading these tours now for about five or six years. And we go up to, to Fairbanks for a week. And I have been very fortunate in that every single one of those trips, we've managed to have both the weather be clear and the solar weather be active. And so we've had a chance to see the Northern, Northern Lights. Um, and it's, it's, it's stunning when you see this. So the, the photographs that, that you see here show these, these vivid colors. And I'll be absolutely honest with you. Those colors are, are not what you see with the naked eye. Our color receptors, our cones, are only sensitive to really uh, bright, vivid, uh, intense light. And the aurora can be that way. But in general, the intensity level of the northern lights is just a little bit lower than what really fires those cones. And it's the rods which are sensitive to bluish green light. And so the aurora to the naked eye look a very pale bluish green. But what these photos do not capture is the movement. Uh, so for instance, in this photograph that I've got right here, showing me looking up at the Northern Lights, uh, I use a extremely wide angle camera lens for this. It was almost 180 degrees from side to side of this picture. And in that time, I think this is a, an eight second exposure I saw a, a knot of light start off to my right, move overhead, and then all the way to the other horizon. And so this movement that takes place in real time that you can watch as electrons from the sun traveled interplanetary distances to interact with the Earth's magnetic field, which is created by our metallic molten core uh, you're seeing not just interplanetary forces, but planetary forces. You're seeing the Earth's core interacting with the sun, and you're seeing it in real time. So it actually moves, it's visible, the movement is visible to your naked eye? Absolutely. In fact, usually the way I spot the, the northern lights uh, to begin with is when you first see them, you, you might think, oh, I'm, I'm looking at a cloud maybe that's being lit by city lights. But as you watch, you look for that movement and that movement is, is right there over the matter of seconds, a few seconds. Uh, typically, like in this photo, it, it looks like it could be a waving curtain. And so you look for that movement and that movement is what tells you, no, you're not seeing a cloud, you're seeing the aurora. And it just, it is, there's a reason why this is a bucket list item for so many people. Uh, when I do these tours, we, we wind up with 30 to 40 people every year. And I, I ask people, all right, what, what's brought you to Alaska? What, what is it you want to see on this tour besides the Northern Lights? Because I, I can't predict that you're going to see them. And people will half-heartedly say, oh, I want to see a moose or a bald eagle or something. <laughs> you get three or four people into it. And they come back with, no, I'm here for the Northern Lights. And when they see it, you just see that awe in their eyes. So I've seen some, some pictures from the International Space Station that make uh, it look like the aurora is below them. Where, where, how far up in the atmosphere are these particles? So this is something that involves our atmosphere. Uh, so it, it takes place at its lower level fully within that, that, that atmosphere, but you're talking really about 50 miles up. So it's far higher than, than airplanes are flying, but it is beneath the International Space Station. Uh, it's roughly at about the level where uh, meteors, shooting stars uh, are occurring. So it's, it's in our atmosphere and the, hence the, the colors of it. And I've, I've spoken to some astronomers uh, that are involved in the, uh, the study of exoplanets, so planets around other stars. And one of the things they've told me is that if you could look for essentially the light of aurora coming from other planets around other stars, 
that could help tell you what gases are in those planets. Because there's, there's nothing special about the aurora in the Earth. I, we've got a magnetic field and we've got an atmosphere of gases. Well, Jupiter has both of those things. And there are, in fact, aurora on Jupiter. Same with Saturn. Uh, they've been photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's this is a phenomena that uh, is throughout the universe. And people refer to it as the northern lights, but they're, they're not just at the north, northern latitudes, right? Correct. There's the uh, aurora australis, or the southern lights. Uh, what the the difference, and and in fact they uh, because it's it's one magnetic field. The Earth's core is a giant bar magnet with a, a south and north pole. Uh, so when you have a, a particular display going on in the north, there is a similar display going on in the south. The problem is that most of the land mass, most of the population, is in the north. When you go down to the auroral oval in the southern hemisphere, it tends to be over uh, the coastline of Antarctica and the, the, uh, the ocean. Uh, so there, if you were to go, uh, your best chances for seeing it from a, a, a land other than Antarctica would be the, the southern island of New Zealand or, um, or Tasmania. And so, in fact, here's a, here's a picture of the sun in a, one of these coronal mass ejections. Uh, you can see uh, the, uh, the inner corona, the, the inner atmosphere of the sun with these million degree electrons streaming off the sun out into interplanetary space. And here is a, a massive eruption taking place off of the, the, the limb of the sun. Uh, and you get this giant bubble that expands outward throughout the solar system. Uh, and in this case, this probably wouldn't give you a strong auroral display on Earth because it's happening off of the side of the sun. It's going out from the sun 90 degrees from the, the direction where we are, where this spacecraft was, was taking this photo. But if you were to get one of these that were pointed towards us, uh, you would have probably about a, a couple of days notice, depending on how fast those particles were moving, how fast those electrons were streaming out past the Earth, uh, that, uh, that you should go out and, uh, and look for, for the Northern Lights. And the, the Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, publishes a Northern Lights watch. So if you Google Geophysical Institute, University of Alaska Fairbanks, you'll find their webpage. And based upon the current level of activity, and the fact that it takes the, the sun about 20 days to rotate once. So if you see a, spun, a sunspot one day, 22 days later, it comes back around again. Uh, and so they'll predict up to about three weeks ahead of when you might uh, want to go out and take a look for the, the Northern Lights. I use their website extensively when I'm up there. And over the next four years, as we go from solar minimum right now this year, to solar maximum, uh, I promise you there will be days where that website will tell you, even if you live down here in the lower 48, go out, find a dark sky location, someplace with a good view to the north, and maybe, just maybe, a little after midnight, you too might be able to see the northern lights. So is midnight about the best time for that? Yes, because that is when uh, you're on the part of the earth facing away from the sun. And so the, the sun's, uh, the solar wind, and the sun's magnetic field is pushed our magnetic field back. And that's when you get these interactions between the, the charged particles and the magnetic field. Uh, so local, local midnight is usually about the best time. And so one of the, the things I guess, as long as we're talking about the sun is the other aspect of I guess I'd say solar awe, solar tourism, and that's that's eclipses. And uh, yeah, it, it, it had been 38 years since the last time uh, a total solar eclipse had been visible from the United States, the mainland United States. So 1979, 38 years later, uh, in 2017, there was another. And so in that 38 year period, for, for folks that didn't have the ability to travel internationally, for, for folks in the United States who couldn't travel internationally, um, 
Nobody had seen one. But just recently, back in 2017, we had the Great America, the Great American Total Solar Eclipse. And there is another one coming up in 2024. So we here in the United States have got this amazing opportunity that we're right in the middle of to see a total solar eclipse from where we live. And it's one of these things that there's, a, there's roughly a total solar eclipse somewhere on Earth about every 18 months. And so if you are lucky enough to be within what is the path of the moon, when the moon moves in front of the sun and casts its shadow onto the earth, if you are lucky enough to be in one of those spots where that shadow falls, you get to see a total solar eclipse. And these are things that I just, again, are absolutely awe-inspiring events. And so here's another satellite image of the sun showing the moon and you can even see as you look at the moon the shadow of the moon here on the right hand side you can see the little bumps and wiggles of mountains and craters on the edge of the moon and so as that moon moves in front of the sun progressively less and less of the sun becomes visible until the sun looks like a little crescent and here's a photograph of a palm tree and during this partial phase as the shadow as the moon's dark disk moves across the sun, all the, the little gaps in the leaves of trees will act as little pinhole cameras. And if you've never seen it, it is a strange, bizarre sight to see. And so whenever we travel uh, either around the US to see a, an eclipse or internationally, and I've, I've led several eclipse expeditions at this point, one of the things I always love to see are these little crescents that will become visible in the hour and a half it takes for the moon to slowly move in front of the sun. And here's a, here's a person with a, a telescope. And this was from a, an eclipse in Siberia where uh, they projected the, that image of the sun. And again, you see this bite taken out as if it was a cookie. And here's a, a, another kid uh, from another eclipse where uh, his mother was holding up a, a colander, so a spaghetti strainer, and all the little holes, again, acted as little pinholes. And so she was able to project these little crescents uh, onto this white card. And over the course of the, the hour and a half, progressively more and more of that, that sun gets covered up. And during that, that phase, it's important, uh, if any of the sun is at all visible, you need to have those eclipse glasses. And I've been, I've been fortunate enough to, to work with one uh, eclipse uh, glass company here in the United States. And so part of the artwork I was able to do was actually create artwork for, for some of those eclipse glasses. And, and I'll be honest, it, it gives me a lot of joy when I, I'll watch news footage or I'll find file footage. And it's like, oh, wait a second, I, I drew that one glass. So, uh, and here, we, here we've got uh, an eclipse. And now you may notice here, that it doesn't look like that dark uh, disk of the moon is going to completely cover the sun in this one photo. And that's because it, in this case, it, it won't. The moon has got an orbit around the sun that is elliptical. So sometimes it's a little closer, sometimes it's a little farther away. And if the moon moves in front of the sun when it's farther away from the Earth, it'll actually appear a little too small and you'll get something called an annular eclipse where you'll get a ring of fire, a, a ring of the sun left visible. And so that happens. In fact, we're gonna get one of those in October of 2023. If you're someplace in the Southwestern United States, you'll get to see this ring of fire. And here's a, an eclipse that was visible from Nepal. Now you were saying that it takes an hour and a half for the, the moon to completely cover the sun, mm -hmm. but totality, where it's actually covering the sun doesn't last very long, right? You're right, it doesn't. And that's because for totality, you need that alignment to be absolutely perfect. And so for instance, in this one photo, uh, this is the very start of the, that totality where the moon is just about 99.99% perfectly aligned with the sun the last little bit of the sun that's left visible, its light shines down through those little mountains and craters that I showed you earlier. And so the sun's light breaks up into these tiny little uh, pearls. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as a, 
a diamond ring. You'll get these little tiny diamonds glinting along the edge of the, the moon. But when that alignment is perfect, like it is right here, you get this total eclipse, that corona that uh, we saw talking about coronal mass ejections. Only during this perfect alignment does the corona become visible to your naked eye here on Earth. But because that alignment has to be perfect, totality itself will last for maybe anywhere from just a few seconds to at most about seven minutes. That's physically the longest a total solar eclipse could last from any one spot on Earth. There, there, is a, there is a funny exception though. If you could travel as fast as that moon's shadow sweeps across the earth, you could get a total solar eclipse to last for an hour. And back in the, uh, the 70s, a group of astronomers uh, chartered the Concorde that travels at supersonic speeds, so about 1500 miles per hour. And they were able to fly across the Atlantic Ocean and have totality last for the hour and a half it took to fly across the Atlantic. I, it's just, it's stunning to think about, but well, of course there's no Concorde anymore. So nobody gets to do that anymore. And then here's another photograph of totality. And every single time a total solar eclipse happens because the conditions on the sun, its level of activity, uh, where there are sunspots, where there aren't, what the magnetic field is doing, the corona will look different. Every single total solar eclipse looks totally different than every other one. And it's for this reason that, that people, after seeing that few precious seconds or minutes of totality and, and the eclipse ends, you know, your first question is, well, where can I go to see another one? And I've felt that myself. So, so how many uh, how many total solar eclipses have you managed to see so far? I have successfully seen uh, four, maybe five. Um, unsuccessfully, I've been clouded out. My very first one was actually 1979. Uh, that eclipse uh, went right over my house in Portland, Oregon, when I was nine years old. Unfortunately, it was completely cloudy. And so all I remember was how dark it got. I've had one other eclipse and that was in the Faroe Islands in, in 2015, when, uh, a, it, gosh, it, it cleared up right before the eclipse happened. But as the shadow of the moon moved over us, the temperature dropped. And that temperature drop was enough to cause the moisture in the air uh, to turn back into clouds. And so I missed totality by about 30 seconds. Uh, it didn't clear up until after totality ended. But fortunately, uh, with the, the tour guiding that I do these days, uh, there's a, 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 an eclipse chaser who's a, 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 a climate scientist, uh, Jay Anderson in Canada, who uh, creates these amazing maps to tell you where are the places along the path of totality for each eclipse that has the highest historical probability of clear skies. And that's where we go. That's where we take our tours. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say it, seeing one of those eclipses, seeing the sun get eaten up, seeing it disappear, the temperature drop, the corona come out, it's a multi-sensory experience. And I, I totally get why the, it, it would frighten people. I, I, why myths and legends of demons eating the sun? I totally get where that comes from. The hair, the first time I saw one of these, which was in 1999 in, uh, in outside of Budapest in Hungary, the hair stood up on the back of my neck and it, it still does to this day. Um, that's, it's really a, a tremendous experience. In fact, here's the photograph, my very first ever photograph of a total solar eclipse uh, from that moment in 1999 where I finally got to see one. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll admit, I tell people these days, you know, I, while I photographed my first eclipse, uh, I wish I hadn't. My memory of that, as hair raising as it was, literally, uh, most of my memories are of looking at this eclipse through the viewfinder of my camera. And so I tell people, if you've never seen one, do not photograph your first eclipse. Photograph your second one, because there will be a second one. Just 
And in fact, here's my second one. This was from the mast of a, uh, from the deck of a four-masted sailing ship off the coast of Africa in 2015, or 2013, sorry. Um, and it was, again, tears were streaming from my eyes. And it's one of these, these reasons why I, I love to give these tours, because it really does build up this sense of awe of this, this precious moment where you, the moon and the sun are all in perfect alignment. And there's, there's something to be said about the, 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 the awe that does come from that, that tells you that you are part of something vastly larger than ourselves. Um, and especially if you've traveled, say, halfway around the world to see this, uh, it gives you this sense of how big our world is, how many people there are there that we share it with, and how for these few precious moments, we're sharing this unique astronomical alignment. Uh, and so I, when I create posters, these travel posters, uh, it's something that I, I do for the people on these trips, for the people that, that go to see the eclipse, they're there with me. But, you know, so it, it helps re relive some of that, that sense of, of awe, both about nature, about the universe, but also you know, the planet on which we live. And for the, the 2017 eclipse, I, I worked with communities all along the path of totality that stretched from Oregon uh, to, uh, to South Carolina. And I wound up working with about 31 different communities uh, along that path of totality. And just this year, uh, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum collected the posters. And so they, and some of the eclipse glasses and even a, a Pendleton blanket that I, I designed for a, a Grand Teton National Park in Jackson, Wyoming. Those are all in the Smithsonian somewhere at this point. Uh, and so I, it, was, it was a real honor. Uh, certainly something is, as an astronomer, I never thought I'd, I'd wind up in the, the Air and Space Museum for my artwork. <laughs> well, that's pretty impressive. Uh, we're gonna have to sign off soon, but before we go, uh, you said that we've got another eclipse visible from the US coming up in 2024. Can you yes. sort of close out by, by telling us a little bit about, you know, what, what, how should we plan if we want to see that? So on April 8th of 2024, there's going to be a total solar eclipse that, well, actually, if you take a look at the poster here on the left, uh, you'll see the little sun disks that I show on there demonstrating the partial phase. And just by, by chance, those sun disks go almost right along the path that's going to be there in 2024. The eclipse is going to go from Texas up through Southern Illinois, through Ohio, Cleveland, and then through Buffalo, Niagara Falls, Rochester, and Western New York, and then across Montreal, then eventually out through, through Northern Maine. So my recommendation for folks that either did see the eclipse in 2017 or didn't and want to know what they missed, go out on April 8th of 2024, get yourself into the path of totality, because 99% isn't 99% of the show. You need to be fully within that path of totality to see the sky go dark, the stars come out, and the corona become visible. Well, wow, that's uh, that's great, uh, Tyler. Um, let's see. There we are. Uh, so I uh, I am going to um, uh, let's see if I can get this. There we go. So I'm uh, going to thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm hoping that uh, maybe we can get you to come back for another talk sometime in the uh, future. Um, and uh, maybe you could tell us uh, some more interesting things about solar astronomy and uh, the fact that not all astronomy learning has to happen in classrooms. <laughs> the best place to do it is to actually go outside. Uh, what's, your, uh, what's your motto for the parks? Half the park is after dark. Okay, great. Uh, well, it's been exciting to have you here. I hope that we can have you back. Uh, and I hope that all of uh, you who are, are watching will go out and look up at the sky. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.